All right, hello everyone. My name is Michael Molina of the Emerging Sciences Foundation and I'm joined today by Dr. Mauro Zapatera as well as Linda Molina of the Emerging Sciences Foundation. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a really interesting topic, a uh, number of topics, but really kind of focused on the mysteries of the body and some of the, the scientific developments coming out of it and where all those things sort of meet with more uh, spiritual topics like kundalini and meditation, those types of things. So, uh, Mauro, welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, who you are, what you do? Yeah, I am. Um, my my day job, I'm a uh, pain management uh, physician in uh, the Pasadena, California area. Uh, I specialize on uh, non, I call it non-pharmacological, non-interventional methods of treating chronic pain. Um, and so I run a lot of our multidisciplinary programs, um, but I do a lot of, uh, I do a lot of other, other things as well. Um, and I'm just interested in really, um, speaking about topics such as awareness, uh, consciousness, the cerebrospinal fluid, um, life suffering, decreasing suffering, increasing quality of life, increasing people's performance. So I try to kind of like wrap all that together in my clinical practice. And really, at the end of the day, as cliche as it might be, try to help people decrease their suffering and increase their quality of life and improve their functioning. That's amazing. And I know that you've taken sort of a, um, a more holistic view, uh, looking at different alternative uh, forms of treatment, you know, meditation, things like that. Um, and I know that you're a, a Harvard MD, PhD, which is um, really quite special. I guess the, the PhD part is that more of the research focus and then the MD is the, the medical doctor side. So can you talk a little bit more about uh, some of the research that you did uh, around the PhD program and back, back in Harvard? Yeah, um, so you're absolutely right. Yeah, so uh, what it is, it's a it's a medical scientist training program, and you do uh, typically the programs are set up uh, if you arrange to do it beforehand, where um, the majority of the programs are set up where you do two years of your MD training, and then um, and so you get all the basics of 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 what the medical doctor trains here in the United States, which is a lot of anatomy, physiology, immunology, um, cardiology, you know, all the different systems of the body, physiology, et cetera. Um, and you even have some, some schools even have uh, where they actually, you know, they see patients for a period of time um, and they take all that information that, that, they, that they gained over those two years and then they try to find something that they want to do research on. Um, a lot of the times, as you can imagine, a lot of questions come up during those two years. And so people try to find things that, you know, are disease related or, you know, hey, you know, uh, this this thing kind of caught my eye or, you know, my brother has this disease and I want to investigate that and, and, and whatnot. And so then you go off and you do your Ph.D. Um, and then after you finish your Ph.D., which at Harvard can be anywhere between um, three to nine years working on your PhD, uh, you come back and you finish your MD. Um, and so that's what I, that's what I did. And, um, like you said, my path was a little uh, more holistic. Um, I was, uh, I was interested in a number of different things. And initially when I went to Harvard, um, I was interested in, um, in how how development occurs and so you know more like developmental biology embryology things like that and a lot of things that can go wrong in development um, and and also cancer and so i was in a cancer lab and um uh thought that i was going to do my phd on that and then i met my wife um who recognized that i was uh probably on the verge of clinical depression uh, and and essentially said, hey, you know, uh, I know you went to medical school to like really try to help people and understand this this sort of human body perspective, but um, but you're depressed and 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 you know we gotta we gotta we gotta change things up a little bit. Um, and so she actually convinced me to take some time off and to rethink things. And um, she convinced me to study with her uh, in in New Mexico in Santa Fe um, at the at the New Mexico Academy of Healing Arts. Uh, where we studied um, kind of hands-on healing modalities such as craniosacral therapy, um, polarity therapy, 
uh, massage, things like that. And um, that really kind of shifted my entire world, to be honest with you. And so with that experience and, and everything that we had gone through during my time off, I came back to Harvard uh, and really kind of changed my focus and went more into neuronal development, uh, development of the brain during um, during during the, uh, the the embryological period and really looking at uh, the cerebrospinal fluid and seeing if we could and if I could sort of, you know, do a PhD around the around the cerebrospinal fluid. So I guess uh, just to interrupt you, Marl, so that that's like a radical shift, right, from from being in a cancer lab focused there to the CSF, I guess. What kind of experiences, I guess, maybe during that time that you had taken off and, and were studying these things sort of led you to, into that that new focus? Yeah, so um, a few things. Um, you know, it's hard. It, 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 it's fairly difficult to like pinpoint one area. I was always interested growing up in um, how our physical bodies formed, essentially. Uh, and and um, was there a component that was beyond what we could actually see with our own eyes? Um, you know, if you uh, in massage, for instance, I mean, you can feel the heat coming off of somebody's hand, for instance. So if I was to if I had if I was able to see heat, um, I would the, there would be an energy wave that would that that was not localized just to my hand. It'd, it'd, it'd be some space away from it. Um, and so the, the question really came like, I, you know, I, I, I can rub my hands like this and put them on and you could actually feel that heat. So there's some energy transfer there as well. Besides heat, what other forms of energy transfer are there or, 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 you know, you know, are present. And so I was always interested in kind of this, this, this concept of, of, you know, what are the energies that, that, that make up the, the, the human body. Um, and my mom was interested in things like acupuncture, shiatsu, uh, acupressure. And, you know, it's sort of like if we had a headache, she'd push on our feet, right? And we'd be like, we, I mean, we were like seven or eight years old and being like, you know, why is she pushing on our feet? And, and you know, she just sort of explained like, oh, well, there are points on your feet that relate to your head. And, you know, they, they, like if I push on your feet instead of pushing like inside your head, I can actually relieve some, yada, 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 right? Anyways, um, and so... I'd always kind of had this perspective uh, uh, growing up of, um, you know, oh, you, you know, you have a you have a headache. Well, you know, do some do some foot massage and your headache will go away. Kind of go into a different part of the body uh, and trying to get the energy to move in essence, um, that there were some channels that there might be channels in the body uh, that had energy movement that could, that, 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 that were responsible for moving energy, for keeping us alive and that you could actually learn how to move, how to move, how to move those channels of energy. Um, and so, you know, so going into like polarity therapy, um, just starting to tune into the body as like an antenna for, uh, other, let's say, energies that may be present, whether they're electromagnetic energies, whether they are, you know, heat, whether it's cool, whether whatever it might be. Um, and 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 so, you know, during the classes, we learn about an anatomy, which I already knew from from medical school, but we would learn about um, the chakra systems. We learned about meridians. We learned about, um, you know, the acupuncture pressure system, the acupuncture system, different systems of energy and how the body was related in, in, in various energetic maps. And since I had this background in, in, in human anatomy, to me, it was always interested of like, oh, what could that point actually be anatomically, right? Um, uh, a, a great example is the, the actual, the actual solar plexus, like one of the, you know, the third chakra, for instance. Um, and, and there's actually, you know, in, in when, when I heard solar plexus being called as a chakra and in anatomy class, we look at the solar plexus, um, as, a, as, as a, 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 a group of cell bodies that is present in the middle of your abdomen. It's like, oh, well, it's actually an anatomic representation of a number of cell bodies, which hold the DNA of the cell. Um, of neurons. And so, 
could energetically, could I feel my solar plexus energetically if I tapped into it? And could that be just an energy center that I'm feeling because there is actually a lot of cellular activity that's actually going on in that area anatomically. And so, and so I, I, I was particularly interested in the solar plexus because um, I had going through medical school and stuff like that, a lot of anxiety and, and my solar plexus was always tense. It was always sort of, I would always have this and uh, we'd go and we'd get these uh, energy work sessions um, and slowly, slowly without, you know, I, it was, it was sort of like, oh, I'm not doing anything. Right. Because in my world, it's sort of like doing, it's like, you have to be very mechanical about things, pushing, pulling, you know, things like that. Um, but you're, 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 you're subtly being with something in essence. Uh, and, and as, as I was getting these sessions, slowly, slowly, what I was noticing is that this tension in my solar plexus was, was, uh, was resolving, was, was, was releasing. Um, and, what, and when I mean tension, it was like somebody had punched me in the stomach. And, and that was like that 16 hours a day, every day of the, you know, I woke up and the solar plexus would tense up and things like that. Um, and so we were getting these sessions. We'd had to give sessions. We were getting sessions. And so it's just, it was sort of like a slow progress. And then uh, we we started getting better at the body work. Um, and one of our teachers was a craniosacral therapist who, um, and, and there was a lot of us kind of more interested in, hey, you know, we're learning this, what else could we learn? You know, from my wife and I perspective, it's like, we knew we had a limited period of time because we were going back to, to Boston. Uh, and we wanted to kind of learn as much as possible during this during this period of time. So we started doing these sort of extra classes in, 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 in craniosacral therapy. Um, and and at the at the basic of it, right, when you're just learning it, it's sort of like, okay, well, what do you, you know, what do you, what are you doing, right? There's always like a kind of what are you doing? And in essence, it was, um, it was, you know, whether you're the practitioner or the client, there's a person, you know, let's say on a massage table, and then there, there's the there's the practitioner. As the practitioner, you're getting into a very neutral space. So you're finding your ground, you're feeling your feet on the floor, you're feeling your butt on the chair, you're getting into neutral space, you're recognizing what what is yours, right? And essentially, it's like, what are the thoughts that are coming up that are yours? What are the emotions that are what are the felt senses in your body, get into a neutral space, and then actually making contact with the body. So there's like a five to 10 minute process that you do as the as the provider, as the practitioner, before you even made contact with the body, and then you made contact with the body. And what we are essentially told is, um, you know, hold the cranium, you know, like you're holding a sort of a bowl, a bowl of water, in essence, and, and just see what, ha- listen. It's like, well, listen, right? For me, it's like, listen, well, like, I can't put my ear to it, and listen to it, um, even though that's probably what I tried to do. But it's sort of like, oh, well, you use your, your, your palpatory sensory organs in your hands to listen. Right? And what do you what do you notice? And that was it. Um, and so as a practitioner, I would do it. And as a as as then as that the client, I would get these sessions done for me. Um, and what I started noticing, especially when I was the client and I was having these sessions done for me, is that um, there was a there was a reproducible energy that would appear. And what it felt like was that it was um, it was uh, um, it was everywhere. So it wasn't localized in my body. It wasn't localized. Uh, it, 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 it wasn't like just outside. It was it was lit- it was it was essentially everywhere. Um, but that there was like a coalescing in essence. Um, if you took, uh, let's just, you know, let's just make an example. Like if I had, uh, water and salt in that water and I evaporate, you couldn't, and the salt was, uh, dissolved in the water. You couldn't see the salt in the water, right? But if I got rid of the water, um, if I evaporated the water, uh, the salt, remains and so now i could actually see the salt and 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 give you a tablespoon of salt where before i wouldn't be able to do that okay so in essence it's sort of like there's this that that it what, what it seemed like was like this energy had the potential of contraction and expansion contraction and expansion there was a coalescing 
and, and, and an unraveling, a coalescing and an unraveling that was occurring simultaneously. Um, and so it was coming into the body, but it was also outside the body. But when it came into the body, then as a felt sense, you could actually follow it, feel it, sense it. And at first it felt like um, there was a sort of, it was rising up from my spine up into my my brain and it was very clear um went to the center of the brain and it was very pulsatile in 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 in, in nature and quality and so the first thing i thought is oh this is my heart rate and so i put my hand on my carotid pulse or my radial pulse and i and i was watching feeling this energy pulsating uh in the it what, what felt like in the middle of my brain and correlate trying to correlate it to my heart rate and it was different it my heart rate was going you know boom boom and this was sort of doing this was like <sighs> slower and so i thought oh well then this is my respiration because we're, you're I'm, I'm probably breathing about 12 uh, uh breaths per minute and so then i I'd, I'd put my hand on my chest and i'd feel my chest rising and falling and it was different than that too and i was like oh well this is a different this is some different rhythm that's happening, some different sort of energy that's here. And um, so I was like, oh, that's interesting, right? Just as a medical scientist, you're like, oh, what? You know, what why, let's try to figure out what that is. What is that? How can we measure it? What can we do to, to measure it? Um, and so the sessions, when I started getting the sessions, this started becoming very reproducible very it wasn't like it was just a one-time thing it was very reproducible it, it happened every single time and happened in fact it happens all the time it's not like it just you know it's not, it's not it's not like it's once in a while um and so just because i knew anatomy and i had acquired through let's say childhood but also much more so going to uh, santa fe and learning about just the healing arts and being more perceptive with the body um, sort of this interoception, this ability to, to perceive more from the inside. And, um, and because I had known the anatomy, I could almost locate, it was sort of like I could use the anatomy that I knew from medical school to try to locate where these things were happening in my body. Okay. And anatomically, what it felt like was that, first of all, it felt like, you know, something was definitely sort of happening in the spine it felt like this sort of coalescing bubbling was occurring this energy was moving up the spine and ultimately from the spine went to the entire body but that there was this um this pulsation this coalescent that was that was happening right in the middle of my brain and when i went anatomically to like where that would be both from a sensory perspective an experiential perspective and also from an anatomical perspective so like oh this is the third ventricle this is the third ventricle of the brain which is a very it's a very midline uh 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 area it's a it's it's a it's a it's a hot it's a, it's an area it's actually a a, a um of like a like a like a vesicle it's called a ventricle um and that contains the cerebrospinal fluid so so in the middle of all of our brains we have these hot we have these cavities and in those cavities we have what's called the cerebrospinal fluid and this is a clear fluid that bathes the inside of our of, of 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 our of our brain and i didn't you know when i was in medical school in 2002 we had studied you know we knew a little bit about the cerebrospinal fluid it provides a buffer to the brain and it sort of prevents against you know if if if, if you get a head injury it sort of helps you from you know getting too concussed let's say um but we didn't really know much about what it did and so i didn't really think about it right i was like oh you know what i thought was okay this is my third ventricle and this is what it feels like um and so i started having these experiences more frequently and so i went up to the teacher and i said you know this is what i'm feeling and he goes oh you're probably feeling the movement of the csf and i go movement of the csf right like i know it like we make it and it and we absorb it but like movement of the csf so um so uh the his next comment was really probably the one that triggered me even though the comment is 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 incorrect 
it still triggered me, right? Because you, because one of my things is, it's like, oh, well, I want to try to be as accurate as possible in sort of the, the description of a lot of these things. So what he said is, oh, well, you know, that's the movement of the CSF. Did you know that the CSF is one molecule away from seawater? And I was like, CSF being one molecule away from seawater, right? And so I was kind of computing this using my, you know, semi-medical mind at that time and saying, uh, look, I'm almost positive that the CSF is not one molecule away from seawater. But what it made me do is it, it actually that night I went to uh, I went to PubMed, um, which is, you know, our, our sort of our national depository of all uh, of all science that has been uh, published and and um, and peer reviewed. And, and they sort of do a vetting process of the articles that that uh, have been peer reviewed and that are in good journals and stuff like that. So I went to PubMed and I said, you know, contents of CSF. And I was like, OK, it's not one molecule away from seawater. OK, I'm, I'm good that I kind of, you know, I, I knew that. But the next question, well, you know, what does it have in it? What does this fluid actually have in it and what does it do? Right, because now he's talking about this pulsation of the cerebrospinal fluid. He's talking about uh, the contents, and I'm feeling it. Right, so I felt some pulse. I felt some movement. Whether or not it was one molecule away from seawater, that was not true. But you know, I had this experience of actually having this felt sense of something actually pulsating, coalescing in that in that area in the third ventricle. I had no idea, you know, that that. I I had never thought about the cerebrospinal fluid prior to that. Um, and so I was like, oh, you know, we don't really know much about this, about, about the cerebrospinal fluid. We don't really know much about its function. It's, it's got some hormones, it's got electrolytes in it. So maybe it provides some sort of fluid buffer to the brain. Great. Um, and we didn't really know, know much about it. So anytime, right, anytime that there's an inquiry into science, into something that could be researched. Whenever you find something in science that there's really nothing known about it or very little known about it, that's sort of like, in essence, that could be like a holy grail, right? That's a, that's a whole field that can be opened up. And, and as I was thinking about what I could actually do my research on for anywhere from three to nine years, um, uh, this was a this was a pos this was an opportunity that I just saw in front of me. I was like, wow, if this work, right, if they say if craniosacral says that they're working with the pulsations of the cerebrospinal fluid and there's not much known about this fluid, maybe somewhere we can actually try to bridge this work and I could actually do my PhD in something that I'm really interested in and has implications in development and health. Um, and that also has that also may give some information to um, to some of the you know holistic practitioners out there that are doing this work um, um, that have a felt sense of this work, but that the science hasn't been described yet to match what what is actually being done. So um, I kept on doing more and more, more and more of this work from a from a practitioner's perspective and also from a um, from a uh, from a from a from a client's perspective. So I was getting a lot of sessions anytime that, you know, you do any sort of body work. It's always really good to give and also receive so that you're really feeling what the uh, what the what the energy actually is. And so I would um, so me and some of the other classmates, what we do is we'd spend an hour and a half every single day exchanging and just giving sessions to each other. And essentially, you know, just imagine like for 45 minutes, I give you a session and all I'm doing, we weren't like, we weren't trying to be like super fancy about it or anything like that. Literally 45 minutes, I'm going to hold your skull. And we're just going to see what happens, right? Um, you could go down so many different paths just with that, right? You're like, why are you wasting your time holding your skull? You could go down that path. You could also go down, wow, what an amazing connection with somebody else where you know that for 45 minutes, you're not going to do anything else except for holding their skull. Like, how cool is that, right? Like, and we, and, and this time emerged right in the middle of me going to medical school where I could just like hold somebody's skull, right? And then 45 minutes later, somebody would hold my school 
uh, or do one very subtle, you know, one very subtle move. We weren't doing like super intricate moves. It was just like, let's really practice this and re let's really just hone in on this just basic, let's just feel our, our, our energies. That's it. Um, and um, so, so over time, what happened is that, um, is that this energy, again, I said, was, was very reproducible. It just, it, it appeared quicker. It was present. Um, and, and, and it felt like it was relational in essence, which is you could have a relationship with it. So I could say, hello. And it was almost like, <clears throat> it was almost like it's, it's responding. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not like you would respond to me if I said hello, hello. Um, almost like, uh, you know, if you've ever had a conversation with like an animal, for instance, or like if you ever wanted to interact with an animal and just kind of like, like as an animal was coming out from a forest into a field and you wanted to have a relationship with it, right? How would you approach that, that, that being that was coming? How would you approach that being that was showing up? Um, you wouldn't go like, hey, you know, like you wouldn't jump out of your seat and scare it, right? It'd get, it, it leave, right? Um, uh, you'd also wouldn't want to like, I mean, we do this, but you wouldn't want to, you know, take a lasso around it, stick it around the neck and pull it right now. You're, you're mine. Right? Um, so if you just kind of have that, like, like if, if that, if that essence of like, there's a fawn, you know, there's a baby deer coming out of a dark forest coming into this field. How would you interact with that being? Um, that's kind of how I interacted with it was like, like my awareness, my attention was back. It wasn't forward. Um, it was uh, receptive. Um, it was curious. It was non judgmental. Um, it was open. Um, and, you know, now when I'm, when I'm talking about it, there's emotions that, that, that arise from it. You might, you might, you, you might hear it in my voice. Um, it's the most beautiful relationship that, that you could learn how to have. Uh, it's profound. And, and, and this has then informed, you know, my relationship with my wife, my kids, um, my patients, um, and, 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 and it's a relationship, right? So I don't expect like in five seconds to like know everything about this thing, right? Or, or, or whatever it might be. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a relationship that grows, you know, um, and so, and so, um, and so I just started working with it and, um, uh, and that then led down to, you know, us going back to Boston, uh, me deciding to just totally shift what I was going to do my research on. And I joined a lab that had the opportunity to study brain development and the cerebrospinal fluid. So I proposed this as my PhD work. Um, and, um, and you know, that's what I did my PhD for, 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 for five years. But during that time period, my wife and I also decided to get trained in craniosacral. So, uh, so we actually got trained in biodynamic craniosacral therapy, which took about two years, but every three months we flew out to Boulder and we had a five day course. Um, and so we learned. So while I was getting my PhD on the cerebrospinal fluid and really investigating it from the highest level of, of science with some of the best technology available, I was also sort of emerged in this fluid and in the movement of the fluid and in still, you know, make like, like having this relationship with, 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 with myself and with others and, and giving sessions and receiving sessions um, and really just kind of paying attention to the movement of the fluid uh, on a, in the body. Um, and, and, and so, you know, so they both, it, you know, they both kind of informed each other, let's say, uh, which, which, which then led to, you know, to the publishing, to the publication of numerous papers on the cerebrospinal fluid. And now it's just exploded 
as 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 you know one of the one of the most important fluids in the in the human body and and having profound uh functional uh functional effects on um on health and well-being and development um and stuff like that so pretty so before we, i guess before we go in more into depth around the, the csf and and some of those topics um i wanted to go back and just talk about this word that you've been using um energy and um, you know, I guess, especially as a, as a medical doctor, as someone who's like immersed in the research around these things, um, you know, there's, there's the research side of it, which basically has almost nothing to say about the energies of the body. There's like no understanding there, but then there's the experiential side, which, um, has been sort of a, uh, I would just call it a, an observational subjective, um, reality for people since the dawn of recorded history. And there was a, there was a 2021 study um, titled Energy Like Somatic Experiences where they, they dove into this topic. And, and I'm just gonna kind of go through the, the super high level categories that they use to describe sort of this energy um, that I think we're, you know, we're both talking about. So they described it first of all as, as energetic, um, energy ish, you know, hard to explain some, something like a, like a, it has a current, a flow to it. Um, some people described it as, um, potentially electrical, like, um, you know, that, that, uh, it moves sort of like a current that it has sort of electrical properties. But interestingly enough, as you mentioned earlier, um, a lot of people who experience this experience it as something that is, um, non-electrical or even intelligent in some ways that it has properties different from anything that is known to science. Um, people talked about it as being vibratory. Um, hydraulic or pneumatic was another category, something where it can kind of ebb and flow and build up and move. Um, kinematic, something type of similar. Um, blockages, that this energy can actually be blocked by certain things. And most often it's um, that people experience is that it's uh, you know, maybe trauma or maybe emotions or maybe thoughts that can actually influence this energy, um, causing it to be blocked and that it can be unblocked. Um, and people also described it, I think most importantly, and lastly, as, um, as agentive. In other words, this energy is alive and acts on its own accord um, that you can control it to some extent, but it also has its own sort of intelligence, if you will, its own agency sort of acting behind the scenes um, in combination with the body. So I know that, you know, this is a, is a study, it's a psychological study. It's definitely not a biological study. Um, but, but what the study mainly says is that these phenomenon are extremely widespread. They're extremely common they are extremely impactful to people's experience and very often occur in conjunction with practices like meditation or in your case, you know, craniosacral therapy. So I just wanted to, um, you know, based on that um, and kind of going from there, dig in a little bit more in terms of like the, um, you know, the benefits of, of, you know, the, I guess the unfoldment of your own personality or your own journey um, through cranial sacral therapy you mentioned, I mean, the biggest change was you moving into a whole new field, but it seems like there's, there was probably also uh, maybe a development of the personality. And you had mentioned like blocks being cleared. Can you talk a little bit about sort of how that has sort of like maybe catapulted you into a, maybe a different direction that your life, you know, might've been from earlier. So. Um, you mean going into a clinical depression to not? Yes. Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, I handed to my wife to, that she noticed it, right, and was able to um, was able to to sort of like, hey, come, right. And if you think of that energy, right, um, I didn't like. Well, I did resist um, because uh, I didn't think that it could be done, right. But then she's like, look, we like we like. There's a way to do that. There's a way that we can do this, right. Uh, first of all, we have to ask, right. Is it possible? All this stuff. Um, I didn't think I could take time off um, from 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 this intense program, right? And and she gave me um, she gave me the confidence to be able to ask even ask the question, 
for instance, right? Where I thought, like you talking about breaking a block, right? If she was, act, if, which she is, right? We, we all are. If she's that part of that energy saying, hey, we're going to break this block, this mental block that you have of not even thinking that this could be possible. And we're going to ask. And then I did ask and they're like, you do anything you want. I'm like, really? You know? Um, and, 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 um, um, so just that, right? So, so this, 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 this hand comes in and, and, and sort of guides and it's like, look, I'm recognizing something. Um, and, 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 and we want to, uh, we're going to see if how we can work with it to shift it. Right. Um, and it's just, it's just a lot. Look, we did, we did a lot of work. You know, we did a ton of sessions together. Um, you know, I, I like uh, my my path of myself was uh, was very um, it was very parallel with the path of my wife. Um, we were both going through you know intense uh, emotionally uh, individual journeys, but also we were seeing like how how can we like how like how how can we make this work together. Right. Um, and, you know, if you ever have, if you ever, you know, if there's ever this idea of a soulmate, um, she would be my soulmate. And we didn't know how to make it work on this physical plane. And so we were trying to make it, we're trying to understand how to make it work on the physical plane. Right. So people ask us now, it's like, oh, you know, you guys have been married for however many years and you guys now have three kids. Like, how did you do it? It's like, oh, well, you got to actually go to energy school and get all the energy gone. Like you got to like clean all the energy first and then you can think about, right. And then you can think about getting married because we didn't get married until 2009. And, you know, this was 2004 or five when we went to this school. So, um, you know, is that like the pre that, that's, that, 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 that's like the pre marriage, like, can they actually deal with this? Because our crap was coming up individually our crap together was coming up because our crap coming up individually is coming up um you know and and uh <laughs> and i'll tell this story i'm not sure i've told this story ever but um you know she uh we got into one of the, we would get into some pretty big fights um because this energy was 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 coming and and i was starting to learn how to express this i was starting to learn how to express this energy um and uh we were driving in um <laughs> we were driving in Yellowstone, actually, and um, I can't remember what you know. You can never remember what the what the what the argument is about. But um, I we, we were driving in her van, and I I I, I was uh, I uh, I punched the um, the the dashboard, and uh, this was her parents' van, and there's a dent actually in the dash because I'm like I'm like you can't say you know I was like poo punched. And, uh, and, um, and I, I, uh, I asked her to stop the car and I'm like, you know what, I'm done. And so I'm like, I, I'm getting out right here. We're in the middle of yellow. We we're like driving into Yellowstone. So we weren't like in the park yet. We were like driving. And if you've ever driven in that area, there's nothing there, nothing there. And, uh, she's like, fine, get out. <laughs> and I got out of the car and I slammed the door and she drove off. And she was gone for about 20 minutes. And I was like, you know, and, uh, and I had, uh, I was like, it was about at like the 15 minute mark when I'm like, huh, am I going to be like, is she coming back? And, and I had my, um, I had a Swiss army knife in my pocket. And what I thought to myself was, at least I got my Swiss army knife in my pocket. And, uh, and so I was in the side of the road and, uh, and, and then all of a sudden I see this car, right? There's not many cars and she comes around, she picks me up and, um, you know, it was just a cathartic, like, it was a very cathartic sort of expression, uh, of energy. Um, and we felt that, right. We knew that that was going on. Um, so, uh, that was necessary. That was sort of, you know, that was necessary to, even allow the energy to even have a relationship with the energy uh, and to allow the energy to express itself. Um, and what's interesting is um, 
uh, in the middle of my PhD, you know, this completely transformed everything because we started really getting into uh, meditation. We started really getting into mindfulness. We started getting into things like loving kindness practices, uh, gratitude. Um, we started uh, we started doing a, a, a meditation practice together. Um, she was um, she uh, was uh, adopted into La the Lakota Nation. Um, she started doing sweat dances and vision quests and 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 sweat lodge um, uh, sun dances. Excuse me. You know, we started doing sweat lodges. Um, you know, we started doing a lot of different things, um, and 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 it was all around sort of creating an intentional an intentional living environment um and 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 clearing any negative energy or any 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 energy that was emerging that was feeling like it was getting stuck or not allowing the full expression of your potential um and psychology today actually if you can google it you know psychology today uh, heard about they're like oh you know they're like there's this guy at harvard who you know went off and left and came back and now he's like he's like one of, he's like a really happy kid but he wasn't like that and so they did an article on me and i think it's called like joy the art of being happy or something like that and it's in psychology today you can you know you can get the the article and and, and read it and it has this you know it has this story in it um so it was it very very transformative um, but it involved, you know, it involved sort of going into that energy and allowing the energy to move and start start having it move um, and being open to it as much as you possibly can with as much of a resourced environment that you can create. Right? Which is why if you go back to um, like the Awakening Awareness Program, which we've done for Emerging Sciences Foundation, the, the you know the number one thing is like what's your resource right you got to have like like in any practice whether you're doing uh, a sweat lodge or a sundance or you know whether you're whether you're waking up at four in the morning or whether you're going to medical school or whether you're you know whether you're having a baby or whether you're doing this or you know whether you're doing psychedelics or whatever whatever you're doing right what's your resource where do you go to where where can you gather your attention in the moment that you feel resourced um, and 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 it, and if you don't have that practice, then take some time to figure out what your resources, um, because that can that can be that can be a savior. That could be a savior uh, for 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 a number of different um, events that that occur in life. Um, and so so you know and so we were we, we were re, we I didn't know that prior. Right. But in together, we were trying, we were trying, we were like, okay, what's our resource, right? We got food, water, we got shelter. Okay. We got the basics. Um, and, and, and in order to get those basics, you know, I mean, I was in medical school. I was at, I was at Harvard medical school and you know, we still may need money, right? Like we didn't have, so we both got jobs at Trader Joe's in, in, in Santa Fe to work. Um, and the, you know, I think one of the guys joked, he's like, I think you're the most, uh, you're most, you're the most educated Trader Joe's employee we've ever had. <laughs> well, I have a lot of respect for Trader Joe's though, having that experience. Uh, if I, if I, you know, if I wasn't at medical school, I'd probably be at Trader Joe's right now because of how they, how they, how they treated us and how they treat their people. Well, I think it, it it's sort of emblematic too, right? Because um, essentially what I hear you saying is, you know, there is a, component of honesty. And what I mean by that is it's not, you know, not lying or anything like that. It's, it's being courageous and honest enough, one, to look at this energy as it's coming up, as it's making itself visible to you, whether that be something positive or maybe a blockage that you need to look at, having the same honesty and courage to allow that to express itself and to flow. And that sometimes can be disruptive. And even in this 2021 uh, study, you know, one thing that came out is someone, and I use the the hiking analogy quite often because, you know, uh, just sitting in your house, the, you know, things are, are pretty calm and, and, uh, but you won't get to see much. Now, the moment you step outside and actually now start down this journey, you know, the, there's risks there, um, there's challenges, there's dangers, but going on that journey is extraordinarily enriching to a person, but it requires a lot of this inner work that you're talking about to sort of cleanse, heal, 
But once you get through all that, you sort of get to this, this summit or vista where you can look out and you have a totally different perspective of yourself, of life. Um, and I think that's one of the main benefits of, of like, it sounds like this journey, the story arc that you, um, that you went on. And it's this like traditional journey, um, you know, to the unknown and then returning back to the world to sort of, uh, to sort of bring new knowledge. And so when you, when you got back to the research, um, you sort of dove into this field and, and sort of started this investigation into it's not the movement of the CSF and um, there was a, that, but also there was a, a component to it, right? That, uh, that was more around the development of, of the brain, of brain cells even, um, that was sort of hidden in the CSF that science had no knowledge about. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and sort of what, what, uh, what you learned? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, I, I, I was fortunate enough to be at Harvard. And one of the first things is sort of like, okay, I got, I got to get my PhD, right? Uh, it's sort of like, hey, there's so much out there in the world. Let me get my PhD. What do I need to get my PhD? And, uh, and you know, we, we need to come up with uh, experiments that we can do that have results. Um, and so that they can, they, they, they can be published. And so um, we, my, my, uh, my, uh, my lab boss, my principal investigator was totally on board and it was essentially, you know, we didn't know what was in the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and so the first thing of, you know, sort of like, if you have any fluid, you want to know what's in it first. And so we had, you know, we had the best mass spectrometers on the face of the earth um, that we could actually, you know, we could give a, a droplet of fluid to, and they could analyze it. Um, and so what we're interested in is um, because I was always interested in development, embryologic development. And when you see this fluid, right, everybody was always studying the cells that were making the body. Right? But if I take a cell out and grow it in a Petri dish, I need some fluid to keep it alive. And um, when you look at yourself embryologically when when you look at anybody we're all the you know we're all the same and like like there's no you know there's no like skin color there's no uh race it's, it's we're, we're, we're all the same we're all bathed in fluid and so what i was interested in from a very developmental perspective was um what is actually in this fluid at such an early time in development that is essentially supporting these cells to become the human body, but this fluid, not only is it bathing us when we're a single layered sheet of cells, it's also bathing, this same fluid is bathing our brain right now. So there's gotta be something in it that like provides some like essential, let's say nutrients or growth factors or, or, or you know, uh, electrolytes or anything, right? So. That was my interest was was hey this is something that we could publish it hasn't been done before um at this at this level um i think you know there was one study that showed um that you know it's like the csf had like seven proteins in it or something like that and we're like it's clearly you know way more than that so we were able to get uh embryonic um cerebrospinal fluid um and uh, do a mass spec analysis on it and just you know just blew the 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 the, the field open in terms of what the cerebrospinal fluid actually has in it. Um, published a paper in it um, was um, was super uh, awesome uh, to figure out you know what the individual proteins are, but also what the different classes of proteins there were were in it. Uh, and then we looked at very specific proteins that we found. Uh, and what we found was that um, not only were there very intriguing classes of proteins that were in the cerebrospinal fluid, but that if you looked at any one protein over time, that there were some proteins that were very stable in terms of the concentration of the protein in the cerebrospinal fluid. And there were other proteins that 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 changed quite dynamically that oh, in one day they would go up and then the next day they would go down and this isn't just like a fluke like oh i you know i just messed up on the collection or this is like programmed like to the t right on day 12 of development this protein spikes in the csf and then day 14 it comes down and and we could show this over and over and over again and so what we saw was this very dynamic flow of you know imagine like imagine like the most complex circuitry 
right? And and it's sort of like, okay, this needs to go up. Okay, let's bring this one down. Or okay, well, as this one's coming down now, let's bring this one up, right? And so you're just seeing this like this beautiful kind of like very dynamic array of proteins being expressed when they need to be for a very specific time point in brain development. And then they come off because, okay, that part is done. Now we need to do this part. And then that comes on and this comes on. And it's because the cells of the brain are, you know, you're, you're like four or five layers and it's all bathed in this fluid. A lot of the instructions are actually coming from the fluid itself. And so that's what, like that was a big part of what we learned was that this fluid is actually providing really, really important instructional cues to brain development. Um, and we found very specific proteins that that had, you know, very important roles in um, in like neurogenesis. So like the creating of new neurons, for instance. Um, and then the other thing that we found was that uh, essentially that the cerebrospinal fluid itself could provide uh, a niche. Uh, or a very specific environment for stem cells to remain stem cells. And why that's important is because if I take a cell out of its environment uh, and put it on a, on, on a Petri dish and just add any old growth media, the stem cell will differentiate. It'll, it'll hit the, it'll hit the, the Petri dish and it'll differentiate into some, some cell, whichever, whatever the stem cell may be, it'll differentiate. And so you actually have to give the media very specific instructions to keep stem cells as stem cells. And what, 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 what that means is that the stem cell remains a stem cell. So when it different, when it, when it, when it replicates and makes another cell, that that next cell stays as a stem cell and doesn't become something else. Okay. So sometimes what happens is like you get a neuro, neuronal stem cell and then that next stem cell differentiates and becomes a, like a neuron that goes and then forms the brain as opposed to stays as a stem cell. Now you're increasing your pool of stem cells. Okay. So if you think about brain development, well, you need to increase the pool of stem cells because we have, you know, trillions of cells in our body, but we also need to differentiate when, when it's appropriate. And that's all orchestrated somehow. Um, and so what we found was that the cerebrospinal fluid just by itself. So if you were making contact with the cerebrospinal fluid, uh, the cerebrospinal fluid provided a niche to remain a stem cell. So we grew cells and they remained stem cells for like 60, 80 days or something like that. And, and that, and, and that was quite remarkable. We didn't add any other, any other media. It was just, it was just the cerebrospinal fluid. So like, if you think about it, right. So now I take it slightly off context, let's say, but if you're close to the cerebrospinal fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid is in the middle. So let's say midline, okay? If you're making contact with the cerebrospinal fluid, you stay as a stem cell. And what would you consider the stem cell to be? Well, the stem cell would be totipotent or pluripotent. So it has total potential or pluripotential, which has, which has an increased amount of potential, right? As you pull away from the cerebrospinal fluid, now you lose a little bit of that potentiality and you become a, a neuron, okay? So the midline has this, potential energy that's actually associated with it that the fluid is actually providing to the cells and as the cells need to differentiate and become different parts of the brain that they pull away from the cerebrospinal fluid and actually go and develop into into um into into stem into into neurons or anything like that so in essence Right, sort of the central core or that central midline provides the potency. And then everything else is an expression of that. It's sort of like, oh, I'm more, I'm slightly more differentiated as I go out from the center, as I go out from, from the core. Okay. My hand, let's say this finger, right, is very different than than the than the neuronal stem cell in my brain that may actually be able to send a new neuron out here to my finger but once it's here it's already differentiated um and so 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 you know so now that kind of gets into a little you know a little discussion of like oh that you know that's kind of interesting it's like as the cells are closer to the midline as they're closer to the cerebrospinal fluid they they hold this potency um, and then there's all this information in the cerebrospinal fluid with growth factors and 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 you know very molecular things that help to give that 
signal, right? That helped to maintain that niche. Um, and then you've got to, you, you have to, right? It goes back to like, you've got to ask the question, right? Well, if it's, if this is a fluid and it's providing these growth factors that we know it's providing these growth factors, we're absolutely certain of that. We can take away the growth factors and the tissue does something else through the fluid. Um, well, it's a fluid, right? So what else can fluid, like, like how else can fluids communicate? Or, and when I say communicate, again, I go back to the energetics of that, right? I don't mean like talk, right? But a, if I put a hormone in a fluid and the fluid goes from point A to point B, and that hormone goes from point A to point B, that's a mode of communication, okay? If I need to get it to that. So, so what I'm saying is some sort of energy transfer or, 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 information sort of not you know some sort of like transference of energy to some degree okay what else and that's what i mean by communication because if you're if you're closing your eyes right and you're on one side of a bathtub and i'm on the other side of the bathtub and we have a priori already determined that look if you feel two pulses of waves that are hitting your legs that means x okay i could just go into the bathtub right and send two pulses of waves down to you now the way now that i've just given information to the fluid the fluid then transmits that to your leg you feel it and now you're trying now you're processing that information right so that's that's what i mean by communication so if you see it as we absolutely know that it's transmitting information that it's communicating via growth factors, that it's communicating via hormones, that it's communicating via things that are released into it for brain development uh, during injury and de neurodegenerative diseases. We know that um, it release, you know, we release melatonin into it at night. Um, there's all these different uh, neurotransmitters and hormones that are released into it. The next most basic question is, well, what, el what else how else can energy actually be transmitted through this fluid? So I wanted to, uh, let's let's dive in and kind of explore that for a second because, and, and I'm going to shift sort of from what's known to maybe unknown or uh, maybe more conjecture, but, um, you know, talking about this idea of like a Kundalini thesis, uh, this, this, this notion that there is more happening with the body and the brain that than science currently understands. I think part of that, the beginning of it is it goes way back to this ancient Indian notion that within the spine, there is sort of this unmanifest uh, energy potential that they refer to as Shakti in the tantric tradition or Prakriti, um, which is effectively unmanifest. It's like the potential energy, life energy of the universe. And through certain practices, there is a center in the brain that then that then comes into operation. The purpose of the center of the brain is to open up a new door of perception uh, for human beings. And um, there's a, a whole bunch of things that open up to a human being, including these energies. But once this center of the brain comes online, this central column then goes into activity and this potential energy then becomes active. And according to the Indian tradition, the the nerves of the body and the spine play sort of this central role in reshaping the consciousness by activating this center in the brain and this the central cavity the brahma randra the, the the cave of brahma um that awakens this new awareness um in individuals and so you know i i think maybe 20 years ago even 10 years ago if someone had told that to a scientist um, it would have been laughable, but what what I'm hearing anyways is that the science of the CSF is developing in this direction where there is an intelligence within the spine that was was previously unknown and is now being found to be extraordinarily important in brain development, um, sort of supporting you know loosely this idea. It's just a piece of evidence that says there may be other functions um, that we don't know about in the brain, in the body that might come into activity to awaken these centers and allow us to perceive things 
beyond the five senses um, and maybe even within the five senses as well. But um, I just wanted to, to, to kind of focus on that. And this idea of this intelligence acting through the, the spine, um, sort of like, what does that look like now in terms of, I mean, in, in your just, in your opinion, like, are, is that sort of the direction that we're moving in? Absolutely. I think you nailed it. I think you, 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 you absolutely nailed it. Um, in terms of, you know, the language, the bridging of the language, um, um, you know, and let's just take a look at it from, you know, um, let's have, let's say somebody has a Kundalini experience, for instance, um, you know, what would, uh, what would anybody want to know? Okay, well, let's, uh, what would anybody want to know? Uh, what are the EEG changes? You know, so what are the, what are the, uh, what are the electrical changes? Um, any electromagnetic changes in the brain that are occurring? Are there any areas of um, activity? Are there any brain waves that we see that are predominant in somebody who's actually having an experience in the moment versus after something that's sustained afterwards, right? So now we're looking at brain waves. Um, this is going to be done. It will absolutely be done. Um, and, and, and people are interested in these, in these questions. Um, the next one is looking at, you know, functional MRI, uh, active, um, active uh, oxygenation uh, changes in brain regions while somebody is having a Kundalini experience, not only during the experience, but after uh, is something sustained? Have there been areas of the brain that have changed? Um, looking at connections, you know, um, different connections of different parts of the brain, because it's not just like the brain works, you know, it's like, here's, here's, you know, here's different parts, they're all working together, right? It's this huge intercommunicatory neuro matrix, probably one of the greatest super neuro computers, quantum computers that, 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 that we'll ever find, um, all working together. Um, how are you know how does the experience shift the connections between parts of the brain um communication then between parts of the brain um you're looking at all that then you know you and and, and you said it right and and we've all been saying it's sort of like wow well if it's got so much if, it, if the cerebrospinal fluid has so much importance in bringing these growth factors to the brain during development and stuff like that well, are there any, is there any change in those, in any of the growth factors or neurotransmitters or anything like that during a Kundalini experience or afterwards? Does the fluid, does something actually get released into the fluid? And that's, that's actually, that goes back to my, again, hypothesis, you know, differentiating here between what we know and what we're hypothesizing, but what, what we need to look at going forward, right? Does something EEG changes? fmri changes in the brain during post whatever you know pre during post whatever you want and then um neurotransmitter changes growth hormone changes uh within the body and the problem with the cerebrospinal fluid is that it's such it's, it's it's in the middle of our brain so it's actually really hard to get samples of right so what we're looking for is we're looking for can we find, you know, markers in the periphery, like in urine or in saliva uh, or in blood um, that that can help us kind of understand this? But if you think about it, right, what if something gets just like what, what, what we're alluding to? What if something gets deposited into the cerebrospinal fluid, just like it does in 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 in, in embryogenesis, just like it does in brain development, that then if I put something in the CSF, then it gets it, it's not like I got to go to this cell and this cell and this cell and this cell. This, I dump it in the fluid and the fluid then transmits it to all the cells. Right. So it's sort of like I want to cover the entire coast of California with a red dye. I'm not going to take a car and drive up and down the coast of California. Right. I'm going to just draw like like uh, let's put it. Let's use the let's use the tides. Let's use the movement of the ocean. OK. And I drop it in in Oregon. And before I know the entire coast of California is red. Um, it's a similar, it, 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 it would be the similar, similar thing. There's so many important, uh, brain structures, almost every single major brain structure is communicating with the cerebrospinal fluid. So if you wanted to actually transmit something to the entire brain, drop it in the CSF, 
right? And now they like, allow the CSF to then transmit, allow the CSF to diffuse, allow, to, to diffuse it. But now we're just talking about a molecule, right? And so let's say it's uh, it's a it's it's a it's a neurotransmitter that gets released. Maybe there's something released by the pineal gland. There's a lot of there's a lot of you know sort of talk about the pineal gland. Maybe the pineal gland releases something. It's being bathed by the cerebrospinal fluid. It's right in the middle of the third ventricle. It's in the back of the third ventricle. That could drop something into the cerebrospinal fluid, and from the fluid, it actually disperses and it goes to all the major control centers of the brain. And now you're having a holistic experience just through something being dropped in the cerebrospinal. That's just a molecule though, right? Which everybody can make sense of, that makes sense, right? But it's still a fluid, okay? So um, what if there, you know, what if through your humming or chanting or, or whatever it might be, the fluid actually goes into a vibration? Like there's a resonance that actually is in the fluid that then transmits information. Right? Would it be so crazy to say uh, we can't get like w- this fluid cannot transmit any information based on a on a on a vibration on a, on a on, on a resonance? Right? You'd be like, oh, I mean, maybe maybe it can't. Right? So we need to look at that. Um, we know, for instance, in the in the rat, the rat has an olfactory bulb. And, uh, and, and it grows new neurons out to the olfactory bulb, and it actually needs to send new neurons out to the olfactory bulb. And believe it or not, the way that the, new, the way that the neurons know how to migrate is that they actually follow the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid in the ventricle of the rat. So we already have, it published in science, very good preliminary data that movement of the fluid can direct where the neuronal stem cells go not only the development of the neuronal cells but where they're actually like 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 transporting themselves to based on the movement of the fluid based on the turbulent movement of the fluid they know to go forward because that's how the fluid is actually moving right so from a very molecular perspective, right? People can say, "Oh, yeah, we're changing that. We're changing the composition of the fluid and that's going to do it." But what other what other perspectives could we look at? Could we look at the transmission of light, of electricity, of other electromagnetic waves? Could you imagine that the cerebrospinal fluid is actually a huge electromagnetic wave transmitter that is perceiving electromagnetic waves from everything and then sending a resonance and and actually the beat the resonance of that fluid against the wall of the ventricle is actually sending uh, some information, right? Was that so crazy to think? No, not at all. In fact, in fact, there's a CIA report back in 87 that looks exactly at that and says, you know, maybe uh, uh, they were looking at some, uh, some things, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I believe it was Holosync or the Monroe Institute or things like that, of how um, how one of their uh, sound uh, journeys affected change in the brain. And it was proposed back then by a CIA report that looked at, you know, maybe it's through the cerebrospinal fluid actually causing pulsations. And, uh, and it's, like, it's like a water pulsation on a drum. And as you get into a certain resonance and rhythm, that now that then sends the information to the tissue, which then the tissue can then reverberate that information to the entire central nervous system, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have to get into the phase of water, right? Because the cerebrospinal fluid is, 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 is primarily water. And the research that's coming out of water in terms of like hydrogen water and, and et cetera, et cetera, are there certain things that, um, that, you, are there certain practices, right? Just like as you mentioned, that actually shift the the chemical composition of the water and allow the water to transmit the water, the hydrogen molecules, the hydrogen and oxygen molecules making up the water to transmit information, right? So we're going not only from a molecular perspective being a neurotransmitter well let's take it one step back. We're not only going from a brave wave perspective, right? EEG waves 
uh, we're going then from a to a to a brain uh, 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 structure perspective, looking at fMRI and changes in brain activity in real time. Then we're looking at neurotransmitters and growth factors and hormone perspective that can be in the brain or the cerebrospinal fluid. Then we have to look at the fluid just as a fluid being the central column of fluid in the middle of your brain. You keep on bringing, you know, there's just sort of central movement and stuff like that. That's all could be coming from the fluid. Right. And then you got to look at the water component of that and the resonance in the water and how water can transmit electrical stimulus and currents. And, and, and when you say, you know, whether you know, well, it feels like an electrical um, stimulus. Uh, so in essence, like, you know, is, is, is our cerebrospinal fluid the, um, the conduit, the less differentiated conduit that is fluid that allows this transmission of energy to occur and uh, in my opinion it's the conduit it's the bridge for the physical it's the bridge for the manifest and the unmanifest simultaneous where it manifests and then it unmanifests manifests and unmanifests manifests and unmanifests um so yeah so i think you're spot on uh and 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 you know any sort of whether you're looking at hormones, um, you know, as they're secreted, uh, where are they released? Do they go into the blood? Uh, whatever, you know, whatever those might be. Uh, these are all really, really juicy areas of investigation that need, you know, that need to be done, that need to be done. Well, one interesting thing about the the whole idea of this sort of intelligence um, awakening in the body is you know, Kundalini has always been associated with this idea of a second birth. Um, you know, the Christians call it being born again. And, um, you know, even in, in India, they're referred to their spiritual awakenings as a second birth. And you had mentioned sort of embryologically, this sort of very coordinated, uh, developmentally, all these coordinated changes that occur. Um, you know, what's not to preclude perhaps the second awakening occurring in some cases in individuals, what that we call a Kundalini awakening, beginning to now orchestrate a sort of similar type of, of growth in the brain of this new activity. But what you're saying is that we have the tools and the avenues to investigate all of these different things to find clues for these changes occurring. Um, you know, exactly. super exciting. And, and I love, I love, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in there because um, I think what you said is uh, you know, you've sort of like, like every nail you're hitting, like right on the head, which I think is absolutely incredible. Um, so, uh, so allow, allow the energy that was orchestrating that development in the embryo to orchestrate your life right now. And the reason why we don't allow it is because we've gotten uh, we, we, we have too many mental experiences. And so, oh, no, it's got to be this way. It's got to be that way. Well, you know what? You weren't there back then. And yet it happened in such a beautiful way. And it was just like a musical, like the best symphony that could ever been played, played and created you. And that symphony is still playing in the background. And if we get out of the way, we can allow that symphony to continue playing. And that is, that's happening to all of us. We just get in the way. So allow that same symphony, just like what you said, like, wow, all this, you know, this second birth. Yeah, because we get in the way and we stop it or we don't allow it. Or so, oh no, I got to do this, that, Whew, that's a lot of work. Right. But that's when we get into it and it's like, oh, OK, let me kind of go back. Right. And now say, oh, here's that deer coming out of the forest. Well, maybe that's part of the symphony that's starting to play. Love it. Beautifully said. And I, I wanted to round out the conversation today as, as we close. And in addition to being you know, a Harvard MD, PhD, a pain management specialist, um, you know, and taking this, this like non-interventional approach uh, to medicine, which I think is amazing. 
you're also doing a lot of other things, um, you know, writing kids books. There's the Inward Inquiry program. Um, not many people, I think, know that, that you actually publish kids books. Can you talk just briefly about sort of their the content of those books and what you're trying to convey? Yes. Um, I, uh, so my young, my oldest is 10. I have a seven year old and I have a two year old. Um, and I, you know, I didn't know much about kids to be honest with you, <laughs> before having kids. Um, I knew I always loved to teach, uh, but you know, when you read these books, um, you read a, a, a lot of books and, and you see, um, if you send your kids to school, um, or if you see what society puts on to children as like things that they need to learn it's sort of like there's a lot of things that like it's like oh you have to learn like the abcs and you have to learn like the one two threes right like you got to learn your numbers and and you have to learn colors and and there's a real big emphasis on all these things and it's like and so uh i was like wow you know maybe we should be teaching them uh, if it uh, other things like maybe we should actually be teaching them about who they are about asking them they're like like who am i what am I doing here, right? Like, uh, like, what are these things that are starting to develop in my mind as as thoughts and emotions and 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 things like that? And so, if we, so my first question was like, if we spent as much time focusing and 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 putting our energy towards kids of teaching them about their attention, um, awareness, uh, what their mind actually can do, um, imagination. Um, as we do on this is the letter a like like oh go go up and go down and go go no nope, do it again oh go up and you know it's like they don't know what the letter a is but we spend hours trying to get them to to figure out what the letter a is right why don't we spend hours trying to figure out what they're what they're like how to actually use their attention what is their attention right how do we and so um so what I did is um, I, I wrote three books. It's a series. It's from I am to all one to all love. And so it starts with I am. And that's sort of like that first that first kind of like realization, like I am. The next one is 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 all one. And then the last one is all love. And it's sort of a series of it's my it's my it's my oldest kids talking to each other. And kind of having this conversation of like, hey, like I'm noticing that, you know, I there's things in my head, like I can see things and and you know, but who's seeing those objects in the window and 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 things like that? It's like, oh, you know, and so it's kind of coming to a realization of like, oh, well, that that, that there's a witnessing presence behind everything that they are experiencing. And then what is that then? So that's I am. Uh, and then the next one is all one, which goes into uh, that, whether it's the witnessing presence or the expression, it's all one. And then it's all love, which is sort of the, 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 you know, the, in my opinion, the felt sense of pure awareness, consciousness. Um, and it's my two kids talking to each other as if they're having a conversation. Um, from a very basic perspective. So it's sort of like, oh, if you want to even, you know, kind of dabble with this, uh, you know, read it to your kids or read it to yourself. Um, and then the other one was one on it, uh, on, on imagination. So those were the three was I am all one and all love. The next one is uh, close your eyes. What do you see? Um, because a lot of times, you know, it's kind of interesting. First of all, close your eyes. What do you see? You don't really think about seeing when you close your eyes, but we do. Right. So what's seeing what, like, what are you seeing? And this was actually, you know, what I'd put my son to sleep and he's the he's a he's the co-author on it is. Um, these are conversations that my son and I would have as he's falling asleep. And I'd say, you know, he says, you know, he'd wake up and, or he, you know, he'd put himself to sleep and he'd get scared. And he's like, I'm like, what do you you know, what are you seeing? And he goes, oh, I'm seeing all these shapes and it seems this. And I'm like, oh, well, can you. Can you change it, right? And this is the this is kind of the imagination part, right? The, the 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 intentional, the attention, right? Well, if you're just allowing those images to appear, and we're not 
supporting them in any way or you know it's sort of like oh you know could i is there any way that i can change these images that keep on appearing in my in my brain and that's essentially where what the conversation is is uh, I, like going into kind of a curiosity with him of can you change your images and suggesting right like what did you do you know what is something that you had fun doing today oh i scored this goal playing soccer you know at recess v visualize that um and so it's a story of him visualizing uh, things before you go to sleep and learning how to uh, visualize. Um, and, uh, and, and then a, a very short sort of, you know, visualization practice uh, with manifestation at the end. Uh, and then the last one that just came out a few days ago is, um, is really goes back to the alphabet book, which is A is, you know, I see a lot of A's for apples or, or things like that. And so, um, I'm tired of A is for apples. And so I want my daughter to, you know, A is for awareness. And so essentially what we did is, uh, is, uh, we came up with a whole bunch of words, um, for each letter of the alphabet that are very intentional that have multiple, multiple words per letter. Uh, and so it's really good. I think, um, you know, words are energy. And so to bring those words into your life, to repeat them, if you don't know them to investigate them, but also talk to them about with your with your kids right what is awareness um what is attention uh what is the breath how can we use the breath um you know what is what what does it mean to be uh whatever it might be right and so those are all words um in there uh, that might get people thinking sort of you know conversations or or they might be personal investigations of like oh wow I, I don't really know how to talk to my kids about that stuff okay well maybe that should be a personal investigation for you so that we can actually be exposing our kids to these words and so that when they go to middle school they're looking they're talking they're, they're they, they understand their attention they understand what awareness is they understand what the breath is they understand what um you know what kindness is or what love is or 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 um you know any one of the books and any one of the words in the book so um i'm very i'm, I'm very passionate about trying to take things that are complicated and making them simple and yeah, you've also done that with with the uh, the inward inquiry program, uh, formerly Awakening Awareness, where you've sort of taken your learnings from from all of the experiences that you mentioned, from pain management, uh, meditation, and sort of like rolled them into this uh, this this course or this series of talks. Can you talk a little bit about like the the applications there? Like, what is it? What is the content of these meetings, and and where are they practically benefiting people who attend? Yeah. Um, so it started with awakening awareness, essentially 24 sessions. They're all on YouTube. Um, and, uh, I, w w what I felt was necessary there was, um, I was getting a lot of, uh, phone calls, emails, consults, and said about, about, uh, people just having sort of dysregulated experiences with, um, with spirituality, Kundalini, psychedelics, et cetera, et cetera. And now, um, it's just really important, in my opinion, uh, to have a to have a really good, solid base and foundation before um, before you before you in, like go off on these investigations. It's sort of like you know, if you go hiking, it's good to have shoes, kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, you could go barefoot, but you might get thorns and and hurt yourself, right? There's risks. It's all the relative, I guess. Um, and so the Awakening Awareness Program has um, sort of sets, I think, those those foundations. And then once I was complete with that, I've actually, you know, given that to, to, to many people to, to just do. Um, once, uh, once we were complete with that, then we started the inward inquiry. So these are people who um, maybe have a little bit more experience with meditation, uh, a little bit more experience with self-reflection. Um, and, and essentially it's that. It's, it's what is the practice that we can do um, that helps us inquire within, essentially, um, and that helps that inward inquiry then um, uh, express as we're inquiring within, having a greater understanding of who we are, so that we can better connect and and be in the world. Um, and 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 so a lot of the practices uh, have, have 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 to do with that sort of investigate yourself you know, know your own resonance, know your own 
um, zone of tolerance, know your own um, ability to regulate your nervous system so that, uh, you know, you can do these practices, number one, and, and expand this zone of tolerance, be even more open to this energy and working with it, um, but also connecting with people in the world and going out. And when you're at the supermarket, right, how do you behave? How do you act? um you know are you are you reactive or is there a response is there is there a loving kind compassionate response that 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 emerges uh and if it doesn't another inward inquiry in terms of that right go within what happened right what was it no judgment just curious uh and so that's 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 uh that's emerging as well Again, it sounds like that that gentle approach that you took, you know, using that that analogy of the the metaphor of the the fawn coming out of the forest, sort of the, the gentleness that we might treat that with, sort of reflecting that back to ourselves as well, and and uh, you know, not being so hard on ourselves being a, a basic thing. But um, no, thank you very much, Mara. I just uh, wanted to thank you for taking on the uh, taking us on this journey into the body, where we sort of learned about these different. Uh, miracles that are happening within us, even from before birth, all the way until the present moment, um, walking us through the research, which is pretty amazing. And some of the tools that we might be able to use moving forward to help us learn more about this process of unfoldment and development. And, and I think more importantly, that journey into ourselves where you, you know, through inward, inward inquiry and through, you know, books for kids and helping us rather than focusing on everything outside, you know, taking some time to to develop ourselves and focus within and and uh most of all just wanted to thank you for for taking the time out today um really value your time and uh, and also maybe more importantly the the guidance to help us and others along the way through our journeys um so just wanted to thank you very much and um any any parting thoughts before we go today uh, well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I think you said it, you know, be, 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 be kind and gentle to yourself. Um, and, you know, really open up to really open up to the, the, the intelligence and the wisdom and the absolute pure love that is present at all times, uh, expressing uh, through us and, and, and in us and with us. Uh, all. And that's it. Thank you very much, Mauro. Thank you, Linda, for being here as well. And uh, we hope you enjoy the show. Again, if you like this, this presentation and the stuff that we talked about, uh, we hope to bring uh, more experts on in the future as well. So please like and subscribe and uh, set your notifications to all. And um, really appreciate you being here as well as part of our audience. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, I ended.